Welcome to Paranormal Almanac. With your host, Kurt Sandvig. That's right, I'm your host, Kurt Sandig. And welcome to another edition of Paranormal Almanac. And on this edition, let's talk about Texas cryptids. What? Not UFOs? Nope. Alrighty, let's do some shout-outs first. We got shout-outs going out to all the patrons. Patrons, you are getting an extra bonus size edition, patron-only edition of this episode. So... You can listen to it just like everybody else, wherever you get your podcast, and that's totally cool. That'll be the regular edition. And then you can go to patreon.com slash paranormal almanac, sign up for little as a dollar a month, and you can listen to patron-sized episodes. And spoiler, one of the stories from tonight's episode that's going to be just for the patrons is my favorite story of this episode. Sorry, regular listeners, that one's just for the patrons, but... Let's do a shout out. We got shout outs going out to Adam Morissette, Karen Weber, Ethan. Oh, Adam. Sorry. Hold on. Tub, tub, everybody shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Every, this is just from me and Adam. Adam, on Patreon, you can feel free to message me and say, hey, Kurt, can you do an episode about blah, 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 whatever it is, whatever you want, and I will start working on that episode right away for you. So that is Part of the $25 experience, the $25 members, is you get to choose an episode. This episode not only is brought to you by Adam Morissette, but you get to choose a topic for an episode, and I'll start working on it. Please don't do Flat Earth. I mean, you can if you want. It's up to you. I don't want to hold you back. You can do whatever you like. All righty. Shout-outs going out to Karen, Ethan, Duran, Nikki Loves James, still and always, Cobalt Slayer 42, Lori, Alicia, Rebecca, and... Stephen Share, hey howdy hi, Jane Ann, Jennifer, Heather G, Zuzus, what's it? Nico Share in the mouse, hey howdy hi to both you. Mark and Tina, Mike from Jersey, Jay Bizzle, Andy Tracy, hey howdy hi, Virginia Mailman, Tony the Magician. And like I said last week, he's a freaking magician. Jason, Vicky, Crow, Clay, Buzz, Libido Works, Glacier Main, Isabel, Jen, Jen, Stacy, Amber, Tracy, Kelly, Joe, Menace the Beast, Kick Ass Magic, Robot, Webcomic, Sandy, Page, Kausch, Batman 666. Man, that beard. I tell you, Bent Man. Good on you. Andrew, Scott, Andrea, Melody, Vanessa, Marisol, Liam. Bake. Bake? Nope, not even close. It, Becca, Jake, Charlotte, and the Beasties. Becca, Jake, Charlotte, and the Beasties. Elizabeth, Voidtech, Sherry, Art Muffin, Tim, Ricardo, Ian, Alexandra, George, Zozo the Demon. <laughs> Hayden, Cindy, Ashley, Carrie, Robin, Will, Lauren, Russell, April, Isabel, Audra, Dorian, Cindy, Bob, Paula, Jeff, Joe, Lawrence. Hey, howdy, hi to the Lawrence Strawn, Veronica, Autumn, J. Mark, Manning, Carolyn, Jaden, and Ashy, Chuck, Todd, Jamie, and Elijah Hendrickson, Dan, Laura Pitts, and the one, the only, the best gamer fan. With three special shout outs this week to Joe Teague, Stitch, and Paul Rubens. Thank you so much, Paul Rubens, for just the lifetime of just being awesome. Just the best. All righty, let's get right in into paranormal news, because I got a lot to get to, and I want to make sure I get to it all. So for paranormal news, let's do this. Yeah, I love that one. That's a classic. All righty. For the first story in paranormal news, I want to thank Jane for sending this one in. It's cool. Like Jane and Tracy both sent in stories for this week's edition of paranormal news. Plans for the biggest Nessie search in more than 50 years 
man, I got to figure out how they got to come on people. I'm the one who talks about it every week. I talk about it more than Ian O'Fadigan, man. Someone get me the hell out there so I can help this search. I want to be part of it. I'm going to do live episodes from the nest, from the lock. Um, what has been described as the biggest search for the Loch Ness Monster, not a monster, since the early 1970s is due to be held later this month. Drones fitted with infrared cameras. See, there you go. While you're fitting drones with infrared cameras, you can't, like, hook me up to, like, four or five drones and just, you know, like, a, a foot above the water. I was going to say inches, but I want to be up a little higher just in case Nessie does come out. A foot above the water, you can just, like, zip me back and forth across the lock. Just like I'll I'll even I'll even dress like a Superman if you need me to. I don't know or, or whatever cryptid from from Scotland you want me to dress. I'll do whatever. But yeah, can you imagine me like like doing the little Superman like flying pose while four drones just zip me back and forth over the lock while I look for stuff? That come on. That right there would sell some tickets, people. Uh drones fitted with infrared cameras to be flown over the lock, and a hydrophone is to be used to detect unusual on water underwater sounds. Organizers say volunteers would also look for possible signs. See, I can do that part. I can be a volunteer. Would also look for possible signs of a creature from safe vantage points on land or connected to four drones a foot above the water. The search is to be held on August 26th and August 27th. The Loch Ness Center in Drumnadradic and a volunteer research team called the Loch Ness Exploration are organizing the event. You know what I like about both of them? Neither of them say the word monster in it. They know what they're doing. They said it would be the biggest search for the monster. Oh, fuck. I just, come on. Since the Loch Ness Investigation Bureau studied the lock in 1972, the Bureau was set up in the 1960s to uncover the existence of a large beast in the waters. People can pay for trips in the lock during this month's search. Oh, come on. Alan McKenna of Loch Ness Exploration said... It's our hope to inspire a new generation of Loch Ness enthusiasts, and by joining this large-scale surface watch, you'll have a real opportunity to personally contribute towards this fascinating mystery that has captivated so many people from around the world, including Kurt. He didn't really say that, but you know he's talking about me. Paul Nixon, general manager of the Loch Ness Center, said that the search would involve technology not previously used before. A spokeswoman added, Volunteers' safety is, of course, a priority during the quest. Not mine. I don't care. All viewing points are on land, and volunteers will be briefed by organizers each morning on suitable viewing points to ensure their safety. Again, I'm fine. I don't care. In 2019, scientists said that the creatures behind the repeated sightings of the fabled Loch Ness Monster, not a monster, may be giant eels, but as you know from last week's paranormal news, they ruled that out. Uh, I'm excited. Like, yeah, do it. Keep, keep going. Do more. Do as much stuff as you can to prove Nessie's existence. That would be, look... I already got one I told you so for everybody that I know when the government was like, we've got freaking aliens and we've got freaking crashed UFOs. And everybody's like, no, I don't care, whatever. But I was like, oh, no, 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 no. You guys kept saying that I was wrong. I don't know if you guys, I don't think I talked about this on here. I actually messaged or, or commented on one of Neil deGrasse Tyson's Instagram posts. And I was like, hey, Neil deGrasse Tyson, why aren't you talking about this? You kept saying there's not a chance in hell, blah, 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 blah. And then they say well, they've got them, and all of a sudden you're all quiet? I don't think so, pal. I remember what you said. Come on, fight me. I didn't say fight me, but but basically I was like, come on, fight me. Intellectually fight me. Anyhow, up next in paranormal news, this is the one from Tracy. Experts say aliens are hiding in Terminator zones as 1,000 UFOs are spotted in the U.K., See, I think that'd be a bigger story. Nearly 1,000 UFO sightings have been recorded across the UK in the last two and a half years, which has been revealed after an expert claimed aliens could be hiding in dark spots just outside our solar system to detect, to avoid detection. An interactive map documents the full list of areas, and I have not clicked on it yet because I wanted to wait till I was on here to click on it. Because if there's one above my house, like, cool? I don't know. I don't know what I'm looking for, but... I, I don't know if I want it to be one or I don't want it to be one, but uh, we'll see. We'll see. But anyhow, an interactive map documents the full list of areas with the most and least amounts of unidentified aerial phenomena since, whoa, what happened to the thing? Go back. I'm, I was reading that. Since uh, January 2021, the spotter website UFO Identified noted a, a total of 957 sightings, including 410 in 2021, 494 in 2022, and 53 as of May 20 this year. 
with more activity seen above Glasgow than anywhere in the world. A quarter of all sightings, and they say 25% in case you don't know what a quarter is, were of a star-like object or objects moving across the sky. The most common sighting was of an unidentified object shaped like an orb, a sphere, and then a cylinder. Alrighty, now let's click on that interactive map. It doesn't seem to be working. I'll let it. I'll just let it load up. And if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But yeah, there you go. Um, lots of UFOs doing lots of UFO weird, weird things, huh? I can dig it. Alrighty, up next in paranormal news, this one made me laugh. Why the crap anybody cares what this person thinks about the UAP House Committee is beyond me. But Watch William Shatner call the U.S. government's UFO hearings ridiculous. Listen, dude, you're like 90. I get that you've been to space, and good on you. I'm glad you got to go to space, and it really seemed to break your brain. But you don't know shit about UFOs. You're not part of the government. You don't have top-level clearance. You haven't flown a fighter jet against a UFO. But, sure, tell me how they're wrong and you're right because you played Captain Kirk for far too long. All right, let's hear what he has to say. We have a lot to discuss with you, including your latest venture. We, 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 have, we, we have a lot to, uh, to talk about. The edge of space bothers me right away. That bothers me. <laughs> I was in space. Well, that could be the edge, okay, let's but send was in space. You were there. You were absolutely there. And in fact, you wrote an I essay. I was in space. Uh, you wrote yeah, an essay you about your experiences there that, I, that really, the really struck me. And I'm going to get to that in a second. But first, I just want to ask you, because we just had these historic hearings last week on Capitol Hill. What did you make of those hearings and the fact that UAPs, as they're now called, are being discussed you know, by witnesses under oath in Congress. It's just, in my mind, it's ridiculous. Oh. You mean some highly intelligent being goes 10,000 light years with advanced technology, arrives here, and hides? No. That's not it doesn't at all. doesn't make any sense. Well, you don't make any if sense. If something could reach uh, the Earth, uh, they would make a, a, a big to-do about, my gosh, there's life in other places. And there is life in other places. Mathematically, <sighs> there has to be. Yes, in this universe, true. there has to be multiple places that, that are filled with life. Life like the, that's like on our planet, burgeoning and, and, and demanding attention and demanding to be alive. But if they're going to make that uh, journey all the way here, it just beggars the imagination that they would hide it beggars the imagination that they would hide okay first of all they're not hiding a they're not hiding b these are men with long distinguished military careers that weren't playing space captain on a 60s tv show and then T.J. Hooker. No, these are men that have long-standing military careers that went out of their way to kind of derail their own careers to whistleblow because they want the government to come out and say, yes, here we go. We have the UAPs. We have the alien bodies. And here they are. For science, not science fiction. But, all right, let's get back to Captain Kirk. And make it peekaboo. I'm here. No, I'm not. You know, <laughs> you, it doesn't make any sense. You were part of a documentary called A Tear in the Sky that looked to find evidence of UFOs and UAPs. What did you learn in that? That the evidence is filled with imagination. People's desire. I mean, what could we want more than to realize that there are other intelligent, and we're maybe not quite that intelligent human beings, other uh, life forms in the universe that have the same yearnings. What's the universe about? What's after death? I mean, the monumental questions would abound, and they would be asking the same questions, but, but they're not here. Because mm. if they were here, they would make their presence known. The, that yearning that we're talking about goes uh, uh, as well to immortality. We all... All, uh, well, that's what a graveyard indicates. Put a stone there. Joe Smith was here. He lived. He's gone. Billions have come before. Billions are coming after. But here lies Joe Smith 
remember me. So the remember me, the fact that I, the human being, was here is an eternal yearning. And I have become a, a member of a company called Space Crystals, which has taken this modern technology oh. that we're talking about and, and um, taking your DNA, uh, say, from uh, uh, plucking your hair and getting the hair bulbs with, which contains your DNA. So if you have thinning hair, that's your problem. But you would take your what, hair bulbs, what is send them to Space Crystals, and Space Crystals, the company, would make a, a crystal of uh, containing your DNA, making it in space. So the space, the the the, the enterprise of making things, uh -huh. experimenting enterprise. with uh, uh, the space vehicle, you would they would make crystals containing your DNA, two crystals. Why? One when Just it comes so you, back so you to put, Earth, you could put them on the moon. Uh, I, well, I'm about to tell you that. No, one weren't. crystal you would can have in your possession, and the other crystal would go on board the spacecraft going to the moon. And when it gets to the moon, that DNA, your crystal, is put on the ground, and it stays there for eternity, alongside Armstrong's footsteps, All right, that's which are cool. still there untouched. All right, stop it. That's cool. That's way cool. But I know she asked him a question. And I know it had nothing to do with, can you tell me how you take your hair follicles and turn them into space crystals and then send one to the moon? I couldn't remember the question because he kept talking, but I have to go back. I got to figure out what the question was that she asked him that made him start talking about space crystals. So you would can have in your possession your nope. DNA. Nope, still talking space, about crystals. The, space crystals. Crystals, the yep. bulbs. With space the, crystals, yep. Taking your hair is Joe Smith. Joe Smith was here. We all since known, but they're not here because mm. if they were here, here we they would make their presence known. Here's the question she the, asked him. That yearning that we're talking about goes uh, uh, as well to immortality. No, nope. we all, nope. so all still not. Okay. Make their presence. Known. What the fuck was the question she not asked him? That got mental him to talk questions. About this? The universe about what's after death. I mean, in the universe, maybe not. Jesus Other Christ, I'm going back filled to the with imagination. Minutes. People's desire. I mean, what I, don't, could... I don't even care. I don't even care anymore. I have no idea what question she asked him that made him start talking about space crystals. But again, why the hell are we going? Oh, you know, the government had this amazing thing with these military people about UAPs. Let's ask William Shatner what he thinks, what his professional opinion is of the UAP House Committee hearing. Like, look, I get that I'm talking about it like I'm an expert, but I have often said there is no experts. But I at least have some modicum of sense of what is happening with the UAP program, who these three men were. I went through and bullet pointed the House committee hearing, which, again, some people still listen to and then went, yeah, I don't agree with it. OK, I can't force you to agree with me and I can't force you to see what these three men were trying to do and how it doesn't benefit them to do it, and how this isn't a smokescreen for pick a side on political parties. But I can at least bullet point it. I won't go, you can't ask me about what I think about the UAP House Committee, and I go, well, you know, there's these crystals, and you put your hair in the DNA and the, from the bulb of the hair, and if your hair is thinning, I can wet it, and then you put the crystal, one crystal stays with you, the other one goes to the moon. No one cares. Not even me, which means I'm moving on to the next story. That's just ridiculous. All righty, up next in paranormal news. Bigfoot film sneaking a peek at Sasquatch researchers in Montana? Oh, yeah, I want to watch this one. Now this it's one, Rocky Mountain Sasquatch. Okay, then. During our recent Bigfoot expedition to the Sasquatch sighting locations in northwest Montana, okay. we reached out to a local researcher named Duke from World Bigfoot TV. He oh, kindly took us there. into an active spot in the Garnet Mountains, northeast of Missoula. We immediately began to identify Bigfoot trackways and documented dozens of Sasquatch tracks and two trackways okay, that's cool. going up and down the mountain to and from water source, a creek. The largest tracks we documented were around 19 inches in length cool. and around 8 inches wide at the toes. Those were the two main trackways, 19 inch. Right, Which I want, figure? I want to get to the figure. swoops and screams. 
during okay. editing, so, we saw briefly oh, what looked wrong. like a dark humanoid figure lean out from behind a tree, exposing itself for a second or two. Yeah, there is some dark, something dark. There's a bunch of trees, obviously. They're in the woods. There's a bunch of trees, and something straight back in the dark does seem to peek out and go back in. Could it be a bear? Yes, it could. But there is something big and dark and seemingly furry that seems to pop out. That's cool. I like it. All right, next in paranormal news, flying saucer filmed in Alaska. That's right. A video from a national park in Alaska shows what appears to be some kind of flying saucer hovering over the waters. Oh, well, this just ruins it. But if you stay tuned, you'll find that the alien craft is actually an optical illusion. Womp, womp. Well, then I don't care. Moving on. I got lots to get to. Let's go on to Anaconda filmed in the River Thames. Yeah, that's right. There's a photograph that's circulating online that shows a mystery creature lurking in London's famed Thames River. Or River Thames. Uh, so some photos have been released from the River Thames in London, where we were based, which were taken in the last few days. Something that looks like a creature or maybe just a rock. Kurt here, it's just a rock. Man, come on. Come on. Screw it. Let's move on. I'm done with paranormal news. Paranormal news is letting me down today. From William Shatner on, it was just making me sad, bumming me out. All righty, let's talk about merch. You can head on over to tpublic.com slash stores with an S slash paranormal dash almanac. New shirts, new styles just came out. Check them out if you want to. And it's not just shirts. It's stickers. Ooh, that reminds me. I got to get a sticker from my truck. Um, I got to put that on the back of my car. Um, it's stickers and shirts and posters and masks and all kinds of cool stuff and hoodies and everything. So if you like the show and you go, I, I don't want to be a patron. Okay, that's cool. But for as little as a dollar a month, you can be a patron. It's cheaper than buying a shirt. But, and you go, well, you know, I still want to promote the show or help the show out. Here's how you can do it. Buy merch. That helps me out tremendously. Be a patron. That helps me out tremendously. It's because of the patrons that I do an episode every week when the day job is really, you know, keeping me from doing other things. I still want to get an episode out. It's because of the patrons. Um, you can share it. Tell your friends and family and, and review it. Whatever podcast source that you find that you use, go to it. Like wherever you get your podcast, go there and review the show. Give it a five star. Give it a thumbs up. However, whatever it lets you do, give a good review if you can is what I'm saying. Um it, it absolutely helps out the show. It really does. And I get that not everybody has Facebook, so they're not in the Facebook fan page, but it's a lot of fun. It's a good group of people. There's only been one person so far that I've had to give the boot because he was trolling. Everybody else has been brilliant. So please check out the Facebook fan page if you've got a Facebook and you want to do it. Um, I am going to do more with Instagram, and I'm also starting to um, – I've been prepping doing some YouTube stuff. Uh, because I just did an episode, and please check it out. I just did an episode of Who's the Bosk podcast. That's Bosk, B-O-S-S-K, like the bounty hunter from Empire Strikes Back, Star Wars. Um, I did an episode of that podcast. You can listen to it wherever you find your podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts, or you can actually watch it on YouTube. You can look up Laughing P Place, Laughing Place. It's like a uh, Disney and Star Wars um, site on YouTube, page on YouTube. And I was a guest on on my my friend's podcast because uh, it was the night that Paul Rubens died. And it was kind of like a tribute that he and I wanted to do to, honestly, one of the best people in the world ever. Um, and I will fight anybody who says differently. Paul, Paul Rubens was absolutely one of the best human beings on the planet. And uh, that one absolutely broke me when he died. Absolutely broke me when he died. And so I was asked, hey, can you come on the show and give like a little bit of a tribute to Paul Rubens? Uh, because we're both huge fans. I had met Paul Rubens as Paul Rubens, and I'd met Paul Rubens as Pee Wee Herman. So if you want to listen to those stories, it's called Who's the Bosk Podcast or Laughing Place. I also already posted it up on the Facebook fan page, so you can click click it and give it a watch. But we did it live on YouTube through StreamYard, through the way that I already always do like the live episodes. And I got such a kick out of being a guest on it, seeing the flip side of it, that I was like, you know what, I got to do more live episodes. So that's on the plate now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some more live episodes. They're going to go to YouTube live as, live as well, besides just being on Twitch um, and um, Facebook live. It'll be on YouTube live as well. I think it'll be a lot of fun, and uh, maybe it'll get some more new people into the show, which is what I really, really want. But please, if you get a chance, 
listen to Who's the Boss podcast. It's a fantastic podcast. The host, Mike Celestino, is great. He's a friend of mine. Um, and uh, Or look up Laughing Place on YouTube and watch a hopefully touching tribute that uh, that Mike and I kind of fumbled our way through because it was still very raw when uh, the day that Paul Rubens died. Once again, this episode is dedicated to him because absolutely one of my favorite, and it broke me when he passed away. All right, let's take a quick break. Let's uh, let's get back into the paranormal. We'll be right back. We are back, and on this edition. I didn't want to do just another UFO episode since the world seems completely UFO'd out. Don't even bring up UAPs to most of the world because they just don't want to hear it. You know, I don't know what we can, what else the government can do. I honestly think that if today or tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning we wake up and the government's like, fine, here's a bunch of videos and photos of UFOs and here's the alien bodies that everybody would immediately go fake and then just move on with their lives. Or, so what? How's that going to help me pay rent? Look, I get it. Rent sucks. I don't want to pay rent either. But the world seems completely UFO'd out. So I figured, you know what? Let's go back to cryptids of the 50 states. I like doing that one. People seem to like those episodes. And let's focus on Texas for this one. All righty, let's see. What do I know about Texas before we start this episode? Um, I know it's big. I drove through it. It seems never-ending. It's, it's very hot. Uh, JFK didn't like it the last time he was there. Um, the Alamo is there, right? Um, it's deep in the heart of Texas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the Alamo is there. Uh, okay, you know what? That's about all I know about Texas. Let's get to the cryptids, though. Let's get to the crypts, as the kids say. No, no one's saying crypts, Kurt. Um, Texas is big. It's got a lot of weird cryptids. But I figured the best place to start, when I try to do these episodes, I'm like, all right, how am I going to start and break it all down? Because if I just go Texas cryptids, it's just going to be a list of BS a mile long. And I'm not going to get anywhere with an episode. It's going to be overwhelming. And I'm going to be like, "Ah, I can't do this one. So I figured let's start with Bigfoot. Does it have Bigfoot there? Oh, oh, hell yeah. Oh, hell yeah. Um, What do they call Bigfoot there? You know, all the typicals, the, the skunk ape. Uh, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, the wild man of the big thicket. Sure. And this one, the wild woman of the Navidad. Navidad. I think it's Navidad, though. So, yeah, it's weird is what I'm saying. Let's start with the oldest Bigfoot in Texas that I can find, any stories that I can find. And it's that wild woman of Navidad. Now, now, wild woman of the Navidad. Uh, now, depending on where you get your info, some sites say it's the wild man of the Navidad, but the majority basically say the wild woman. So I'm going with those and includes actually newspaper articles. So I'm just going to go with that information. We go all the way back to 1834 or 1836 for this one, but I think it's 34. It's a lot of discrepancy in, in the information. Um, but we go back to the Navidad River. Let's see how I pronounce Navidad so I don't piss off Texans the whole time. Navidad pronunciation. Here we go. It says. Navidad. Navidad. Na- B. Whoa. Dad. Okay, great. Navidad. 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 B. Dad. Oh, she's angry. Navidad. Okay, stop it. Please, please stop it. Navidad. Whatever, it's the Navidad. Uh, We go back to 1834, 1836, and we go along the Navidad River. It's uh, near today's Sublime, Texas. No relation to the band. So um, large footprints were found along the banks of the Navidad River. Now, slaves in the area started calling it the thing that comes because no one ever saw it, but they found a ton of tracks. Then they started noticing that sweet potatoes and corn began to disappear from the fields that the slaves were forced to work in. And uh, people started wondering, was it a runaway slave? Was it Native Americans doing it? But when they went to look at the tracks, they said, no, these tracks are way too big. Even though they're human foot shaped, they're huge and there's multiple of them. Spoiler, it's going to be a Bigfoot. Again, depending on where you get your info, people say, oh my God, I was choking on the Navidad. 
Navidad. Um, depending on where you get your info, people say that the wild people at this point, because that's all they called them, it was more than one set of prints would also, they would come in, these wild people would also come in and steal pigs and even go into houses in the middle of the night, step over sleeping dogs, somehow not waking them, and steal half of what was in the cupboards. Witnesses said in the fall, about the time to butcher hogs, the wild man would creep onto farms and ranches, take the fattened pig and replace it with a smaller, leaner pig. And no one could ever figure out how a man or a woman could get past fierce dogs while carrying a pig and get away with it. Another bizarre thing about this Bigfoot story. There were some reports, actually quite a few, that tools would, uh, would disappear as well, only to reappear later, beautifully polished. Occasionally, searchers would find like a camp or something that seemed like a wild person or some kind of crazed person was living in it. But, quote, the thing never returned while they waited for it. So the Reverend Samuel C.A. Rogers, that's Samuel C.A. Rogers, who is a minister in the area, he was quoted in Taylor's account, that's the person that was writing about this whole thing on the, in the newspaper and in a book, as saying that he first saw three prints in the spring of 1845. Now, he continued to spot them for several years before all but the largest disappeared. He said a few years after that time, he wrote in his journal, a few years after that time, a hunting party near Morales found a peculiar pile of leaves and sticks covering the skeleton of a man. So they think that one died, but people then started to see the wild woman. It was no longer just something that they saw tracks of. They actually started to see her. Now, in his book, Tales of Old Time Texas, well-known author, I don't know why they call it that because I don't know him, well-known author J. Frank Doby, he talked about the wild woman, and this seems to be where most of the facts or infos from this case actually comes from. If you find a billion sites about this wild woman in Navidad, they all seem to have one source, and it seems to me to be this book, Tales of the Old Time Texas. He said, there was a manhunt for the wild woman in 1846. Time and again, men would try and track her, or it, whatever, down, but she was way too fast and way too agile. In his book, eyewitnesses actually said, Presently, the breaking of small sticks and the hurried wrestling of the brush near one of the lasso men announced the approach of something. A minute later, it bounded with a light and flying step into the open prairie in the bright light of the moon. So they actually saw this wild woman, and they said she was fast. They could not get near her if she decided to start sprinting. One settler, a man named Samuel Rogers, he said, yes, I did see the three sets of tracks back in the spring of 1845. But he said it's down to definitely seems to be down to one woman. Um, he said, yes, there was a group of wild people. He had hired a man by the name of Hall. Um, he said that Hall had had misadventures with the creatures, but didn't really go into more detail than that. Hall claimed that they had taken one of his trace chains and uh, shortly after this incident, only one set of tracks were seen in the area. And again, folks began to speculate that two of the wild people had died. From the size of the remaining tracks, they decided that the living subject was probably a male. But they had nothing to go on besides the fact that the tracks were large because it's a Bigfoot. But it does seem the woman Bigfoot was seen a lot. They said at the time, they said the wild man would take what he needed from the farms and the land. He would slip into fields and steal potatoes. When the corn was in roasting ear, he would come nearly every night to get a supply. Rogers, along with some of his neighbors, they came close to actually catching the, quote, wild creature once. Uh, during the chase, he dropped a basket containing various items. Roger added in his entry, This basket contained a shirt of mine, a novel, a Bible, and many other articles taken from the house. The shirt had been torn and then rent sewed up as skillfully as any woman could have sewed it. Kurt here, here's the problem. At the exact same time that the wild woman was running around this area, there was an escaped slave that they did end up sadly catching and then reselling, or I don't know what they call it, but I guess reselling. Um, so there was a slave at this exact same time. So the, a lot of these stories seem to kind of overlap. They start talking about the wild woman, and then they start talking about the slave. In my mind, from what I can gather in his journal... 
when they were chasing this wild person that was eating all the ears of corn and this basket was dropped by the wild person, it's the slave. Because right after this, this same person, Rogers, was part of the party that actually caught the slave up a tree, dragged him down. Um, someone talked to him in whatever native language we had, and then they sold him into slavery again. So it's a really sad story. But anyhow, um, they also thought that she might be a lost white child. Kenny, another person, wrote that she was seen once during a failed attempt to ambush her, and he described it this way. The night was dark, and they could only see a shadowy form. It was slim and apparently unclothed, but the color could not be distinguished. They sprang out to seize her, but they were active young, but even though they were active young men, she was more agile, still, and bounded away as silent and quickly as silently and quickly as the fitting of the shadows, and was instantly lost in the darkness. Now, the creature was seen, and they call it a creature, the Bigfoot, was seen. It was most often described as covered in short brown hair, completely covered in short brown hair. So, not a slave, not a missing, lost white child. And they said that this allowed it to elude capture for many years because it blended in instantly with the environment around there. Now, another eyewitness hunter said, it was the wild woman. She ran directly across the prairie in the direction of the main forest. The man nearest her rode a fleet horse, and it needed all the speed it had to keep up with the object of pursuit. His horse needed to speed all its speed it had to keep up with the wild woman. As the figure neared the, the dark woods, the rider was able to throw his lasso, but as the rope neared the woman, the horse shied away and the lasso fell short. The figure darted in the woods, never to be seen again. Now, that rider who had almost roped the... Um, the Bigfoot, basically, said that it had long flowing hair that traveled down most almost to its feet and wore no clothing. He said her body seemed to be entirely covered by short brown hair. He said as she fled to the woods, she dropped a club to the ground that was about five feet long and polished to a wonder. Now, that same author, that Doby guy, he wrote, Of course, all this happened many years ago, and in the telling, you can always guarantee some buildup in the information will take place. If these things did happen, I cannot explain how. So like I said, the wild woman was never caught, and many people think that she died from the elements or moved on away from the settlers who were constantly trying to capture her. I'm thinking probably that one. Now, skeptics say, this is that thing that I was talking about a minute ago, skeptics say, no, this is all a case of uh, misidentification because that slave man was caught in the area who had escaped, resold into slavery, uh, they said that he was the wild man, but there is no evidence that I can find that the stories are related. Like I said, they seem to overlap quite a bit because it was both happening. They got a lot of the information from a journal, and while they were looking for the wild woman, they captured this slave. So it seems to really overlap. Um, all right, let's stick with Texas Bigfoot for a little bit. Um, here's a couple of mid-episode paranormal news on Texas Bigfoot. This one is from uh, August 28th, 2022. A Texas woman investigates Sasquatch sightings. Uh, let's see. Uh, artist Sibylla Irwin loves the time she spends in her San Antonio area's art studio. San Antonio seems to be a big hotspot, especially lately for Sasquatch. Uh, she goes on to say that she loves drawing pictures and making paintings of Sasquatch. Um, she said her fascinated, fascination with the creature began decades ago. She said she later became a researcher and said she became face-to-face -face with Bigfoot. All of a sudden, his head and shoulders came out on the left side of the tree. I was like, oh my gosh, is this actually happening? There have been times I've been absolutely terrified. She said it was like a thousand-pound refrigerator with a head. It started coming across the river, so he started shooting. Wait, who started shooting? What's this? People's reactions are also different. Erwin says one eyewitness took matters into their own hand. Oh, yep, yeah, don't fucking shoot Bigfoot. Started coming across the river, so he started shooting. Many people won't tell anyone what they've seen. Erwin says they're afraid no one will believe them. She says her sketches help these people heal. If I can contribute to someone else's life by drawing what they've seen, I just feel like I'm so blessed. Yeah, I think that's cool. We got to get rid of the stigma. If you see something, say something. Even if it's just somebody, you know, like somebody like me. Tell your story. Get your story out there. Tell me your story. I'll tell your story if you don't want to. If you want to keep it completely 
um, anonymous, email paranormalalmanac at gmail.com, and I will read your story on the air. All right, the next story in paranormal news, this one comes out of uh, 2012, Photographer snaps possible Texas Bigfoot shot. And I think that I talked about this on a previous Bigfoot episode. But um, they said there have been many reports of the Bigfoot in remote East Texas locations and even near Dallas. And a photographer says he is proof that Bigfoot may be closer than we think. The Dallas area photographer, who remains anonymous, was never a Bigfoot believer by his own admission. He said, no, I've never seen one, never, be- never even believed in one. But a huge stone thrown at him in the woods one camping trip with no one else around changed his mind. He says an object landed within 10 feet of us that I know of no human being able to throw it that far. There was, there's, there was one about 10 feet tall, a, a family group drew in close, three of which got within 15 feet of me. It looked like something out of a Steven Spielberg movie, not human as I know it. That's cool. That's way cool. That'll make you a believer real quick. All righty. Uh, like I was saying a minute ago, it seems like if you want to see Bigfoot in Texas especially in the 70s. San Antonio was the place to be. Uh, They had a bunch of sightings in the mid-70s. Here's a couple of examples. Uh, There were two sightings near Kelly Air Force Base. A witness saw a seven-foot-tall brown Bigfoot run out of his backyard. A few days later, his next-door neighbor, they saw a three-foot-tall brown creature sitting on her back step. It ran off on two legs. The summer of 1976 brought a sighting in Hallsville, Texas. Uh, This is where a witness saw a 12-foot-tall silver-haired Bigfoot shucking corn. A smaller red-tinged female creature accompanied it. From there we go to July 6, 1977. Three witnesses saw the Holly Him. The Holly Him threw rocks at them. This occurred at the Abilene Boys Ranch near Holly, Texas. The next month, Three women saw a Bigfoot on the road near Trinidad, Texas, which borders Cedar Creek Lake. Two weeks later, a man saw a seven-foot-tall Bigfoot on a road near Corsicana, which is in the same general area. In January of 1978, a woman in Sand Hill reported to the Harrison County Sheriff's Department that a Bigfoot growled at her and was fighting with some dogs in the woods in the community about eight miles west of Marshall on U.S. Highway 80. In June of 1978, in the town of Vidor, or Vidor, Texas, A couple had so many sightings of a Bigfoot around their house that they were forced to move out. August of 78 brought a flap of activity to Commerce, Texas. Uh, The Sulphur River Bottoms on the 19th in broad daylight, a witness saw a Bigfoot cross the road ahead of him, and it went across a pasture towards the river. Also that month, a witness saw a seven-and-a-half-foot-tall Bigfoot cross a 42-foot-wide road in three steps while he was driving at night. Two days later on the same road, Three boys saw a Bigfoot around midnight. Uh, there have been several reports out of the Woodlawn area. A family out after visiting a uh, family on Easter Sunday decided to stop to commune with nature when the husband did a little target practice. After only a few shots, a large animal lunged at them and chased them back to their car. Well, that's just dumb. On, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, on New Year's Eve 1996, a mother and her son saw a large animal crouched on the side of the road. Uh, where was I? Fall of 87, a deer hunter on the southeast side of Benton Lake off Big Cypress Bayou above Cato Lake or Cato Lake observed a large hair-covered animal stand up from a crouch position in one foot of water. The creature did not detect the camouflage hunter as it turned on its head from, as it turned its head from side to side, walked out of the water and disappeared in the woods. January of 1992, the Hamilton Herald News reported a lengthy new letter by a man that claimed that while he was driving home from Stevensonville late at night with his family, They all saw a huge hairy creature on the riverbank. The letter said, It stood, I would say, approximately seven to eight foot tall, weighing probably between four and five hundred pounds. Its body was covered with hair. It had long arms that extended down to its knees. Its face almost looked human. It looked at us and growled a low moan, showing four fangs like teeth, two on top, two on the bottom, and the rest flat like humans. Then it hurled over the guardrail and ran off into the night towards the brush along the riverbanks on the west side. For the record, we're not drunk or doing drugs or anything like that, and we have respectable jobs in this and surrounding towns. We are not crackpots. I thought maybe there are others living here that had similar experience, and I'd love to come forward now that the door's open to talk about it. Yeah, that's the way to do it. That's perfect. Um, then there was one from a Hilda Lunsford. She wrote the newspaper saying that one morning in 1985, while driving between Olin and Cransfield Gap, A huge thing came out of the side of the road and got right in front of the car and stood up on its hind legs, and I stopped and locked my doors in the car and waited to see what was going to do. 
It looked right at me. It had a face of an ape and was a big black something. Yes, I was laughed at for telling it, but every word is true. October 1995, Danny Sweeten had an encounter near Cleveland, Texas, 40 miles north of Houston. While out surveying some land he was considering buying, he came upon a creature lying on the ground. The animal rose on two legs and ran towards Sweeten. It hit him in the chest and caught him under the chin with its forearm, flipping him over and knocking two teeth loose. Holy crap. He was dazed but managed to to shoot some video as the creature retreated into the woods. He quickly left the area. Um... He said that he was harassed by an investigator from a non-existent government agency, a man named as the Federal Wildlife Wildlife Protection Agency. He was told to turn over the tape. He eventually sold the tape to the television show Strange Universe. The footage was shown on November 3, 1997, along with comments by several well-known Bigfoot researchers. Lauren Coleman was interviewed with Danny Sweeten on Art Bell's radio program, Coast to Coast. That's awesome. Uh, Then finally, in uh, December of 2001, a deer hunter saw a seven-foot upright stooped ape-like figure, dark brown in color. This was near Marshall, Texas. He observed it for two minutes through his rifle scope from a distance of at least 150 yards. He observed it picking up apples that the hunter had put out to attract deer. 2003, that was an eight-foot Bigfoot crossing Highway 154 in front of a car at the Little Cypress Bayou. But it seems that the highest concentration... If you're in the Texas area and you want to see a Bigfoot, the highest concentration has come from the east and southeast Texas, particularly the Piney Woods region. And then um, there's something I wanted to kind of bounce around in. It's the Bigfoot Information Project. It has a map of Texas and where Bigfoot sightings are. They said uh, the beginnings of Bigfoot lore really seemed to kick off in about 1924. Uh, There's a guy that wrote about one from... uh, 1970, <clears throat> pardon me, um, he's, he talked about in 1965, there was a rash of reports of a giant hairy creature roaming the thickets and backcountry between Jennifer, Jefferson and Longview, Texas, but nearest to Longview. Um, he said that several head of cattle and a couple of people were supposedly killed by it. That seems like that'd be a bigger story. Um, there's a ton of photos and like really bad photos of like basically of trees and then they'll have like a red circle, but there's a ton of that information of sightings where they found them in Texas. So if you want to go to bigfootproject.org and then look up Texas, there you go. Now this next one, I got to keep moving. We're already at 47 minutes. This next one might be a Bigfoot. You might be a Bigfoot if you're hairy and you live in the woods. Um, This next one might be a Bigfoot because some cryptozoologists think that Bigfoot is the only explanation for the next creature. It's called the Bear King. For this one, we go back to 1901 because the story was written about May 11th, 1901, and it was written in the Washington Bee. That's Washington, D.C., but it's a story that happened in Texas. Yeah, I have no idea either. According to the article... A little girl named Ramey Arland, who was, quote, a pretty girl and the acknowledged belle of Marble Falls. So, you know, she's got that going for her, I guess. Well, uh, one evening, Ramey and her mother were, like, in the house. And her mother's like, you know, go outside and get the get the family sheep. I don't know what you got to do with sheep. Herd them. Herd those sheep. Uh, so the mom's in the kitchen cooking when... She hears Ramey screaming, so she runs outside, and as she's running outside, she also hears a panther growling along with, you know, more Ramey screams. Okay, Ramey, we get it. You can scream. Bella the Marble Falls. Uh, So the mom runs back inside, grabs her rifle, runs towards the screams, but... Hold on. But... No Ramey is found. Not the Bell of Marble Falls! So the mom gives up way too quickly, in my opinion, but she goes and gathers a search party. Now, the search party combs the woods, but again, no Ramey and no Panther. She's just gone until the next day when a hunter stumbles upon a disheveled Ramey who tells everyone what happens once the hunter brings her back to town. And she was nowhere near town. So she said, as she was tending the sheep, a large black bear suddenly appeared in front of her. So she freezes, and the bear just suddenly runs away. And she's like, well, that's, that's weird. But 
She says, then a curious looking animal running on four feet sprang out of the chaparral into the trail. Ramey thought that it looked somewhat human, recalling a Kickapoo legend about the Bear King. Look, I don't need to tell you guys about the Kickapoo legend of the Bear King, except that I think I am right now, so I'm going to keep going. Anyhow, the Bear King grabs the girl, glared into her eyes, and let out, quote, a horrid sound. It tosses Ramey over its hairy shoulder and walks upright towards the Moon Mountains. Now, she said the creature walked with her over its shoulder for miles until it reached the cave hidden in the mountainside. So they go inside the cave, and the bear king, you know, tosses her to the ground. So she immediately, boom, tries to run out of the cave. But, oh, no, bear king grabs her by the arm and then hits her about the head. So uh, that's bad. So she's on the ground. The bear king decides to go to sleep. Raimi waited an hour and then quietly ran out of the cave. Alrighty, so the hunters go back to where she was found and then head towards the mountains to search for the Bear King. Uh, They said the Bear King stood up. They found him, apparently. They said the Bear King stood up, started snapping and grinding its teeth while beating its chest and letting out a scream like a panther's. Well, the mom was right about that one then. And then they fucking shot the Bear King. All right, look, I'm not going to say it, but you you all know what I was about to say. Uh, So, yeah, no body, no photos of the Bear King, No names other than Ramey. And yeah, you know, I do typically love old newspaper articles as proof of his story. But again, this one newspaper article only ran in a Washington, D.C. paper. I can't find any records of a Ramey Arland or any Arlands for that matter in Texas. And um, there are no moon mountains near the Marble Falls you know, where that cave supposedly was. There are no chaparrales, which I don't even know what a chaparral is. Um, the only thing that comes up under the Bell of Marble Falls is people relaying this story, regurgitating this story again and again and again. So, yeah, I'm going to say this is probably an urban legend or just a fake story that some guy decided to write and he happened to pick, for whatever reason, the this area, Marble Falls. But... There doesn't seem to be any Ramey Arland. Like I said, there's no other names ever associated with any other of the people there. No bodies, no photos of bodies, no skeletons, no nothing. But again, it's only a guest. So I guess, you know, like long live the Bear King is what I'm saying. Okay. That about does it for Bigfoot. But even though we're almost in an hour, this Bigfoot, this episode isn't called Bigfoots that live in Texas. Now, is it? Is it? No, no, it's not. So, even though we're in almost an hour, let's get to more cryptids, like this next one. It's called the Houston Batman. All right, we obviously go back to Houston. Um, We're going to go all the way back to 2.30 a.m. on June 18th, 1953. That's when Hilda Walker, Judy Myers, and Howard Phillips saw, quote, a man with wings like a bat. So, yeah, you know what? And it was in Houston, so Houston Batman, that, that checks out. They said they saw him sitting... Hi, Rum. Hello. How's my girl? Yes, I'm telling the story of the Houston Batman. It's one of your favorites. You like it? All right, I love you too. Let me let me keep talking, okay? Yes, you're great. Thank you, sweetheart. Go back down. I love you. All righty, where was I? Oh, yeah. They saw a man with wings like a bat sitting in the branches of a nearby tree just watching them. Now, after a few moments, there was a strange yellow or orange light that came from behind him, I guess. Then, the light fades, and the Batman was gone. Here it is from the Houston Chronicle front page news story at the time. Hilda Walker, a 23-year-old housewife, and two of her neighbors were sitting on the front porch, and suddenly Hilda noticed a large shadow moving across the lawn. It was then that they could make out its form. Walker said... 25 feet away, I saw a huge shadow across the lawn. I thought at first it was the magnified reflection of a big moth. That's a big freaking moth, dude. Caught in the nearby streetlight. Then the shadow seemed to bounce upward into a pecan tree. Pecan? Pecan. 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 Sure, why not? Uh, I'm just trying to think of how I say the word pecan. I think it's... uh, Did I say pecan pie? Now now I'm in my head. I can't... It doesn't matter. It's in a tree. We all looked up, and that's when we saw it. We heard a loud swoosh over the housetops across the street. It was like the white flash of a a torpedo-shaped object. 
I've heard so much about the flying saucer stories, and I thought all those people telling the stories were crazy, but now I don't know what to believe. I may be nuts, but I saw it, whatever it was. I sat there stupefied. I was amazed. Well, I think at first he was amazed. Then he was stupefied. He kept thinking all, never mind. Uh, Philip stated, we looked across the street and we saw a flash of light rise from another tree and take off like a jet. One of the witnesses, Howard Phillips, a tool plant inspector, he told the Houston Chronicle, I could hardly, I could hardly believe it, but I saw it. All righty. So there were three witnesses. They all had the same descriptions. Appeared to be a very tall man or man-like figure standing about six and a half feet tall, but with bat-like wings attached to his back. It also seemed to be encased in a halo of glowing light. So yeah, the, uh, the witnesses sat there. They watched it. They were stunned. They sat there and watching it for about 30 seconds. Then the light faded, figure vanished. And uh, Judy Meyer said, that's when I let out an ear-piercing scream immediately afterwards. Okay, Judy, calm down. Uh, let's see. This was the one and only time that the Houston Batman was ever seen. So, what was it? No idea. Why did it glow? Nope. No idea. Where did it go? Still, no idea. I have no idea. Why are you asking me all these questions? Was it a cosplayer? Sure, why not? Does it have a better ass than Mothman? No. No, it does not. Rum. I'm talking about the I'm talking about the Houston Batman, baby. Be cool, sweetheart. Um, it does not have a better ass than Mothman, and I will fight anybody that says differently. Um, there's another news article about it, but it's about basically the same thing. There was only one sighting. Houston residents cite Batman on tree perch and yard. Five persons, now it's five, all of whom live in the same house. Now they live in the same house. Sure, why not? Complained to police. I don't think they complained. I think they were just reporting him. That they saw a combination of Superman and Captain Midnight perched in an oak tree outside their homes. Wow, there's a lot of weird facts going on. They call it Batman in the headline, but they immediately call him a combination of Superman and Captain Midnight. And now he's perched in an oak tree, not a pecan tree. Um, and said he disappeared in the light of a mysterious rocket and a second aerial display. Police said... They were investigating the stories, but admitted they were not equipped to handle such phenomena as the five persons described. We have uh, Miss Hilda Walker, same person, accompanied by her husband Lloyd, was the first to report the affair to authorities. Shadow settled in the tree. She said it was about 2.30 a.m. Why are they outside at 2.30 a.m.? Uh, and because it was so hot, her husband, the 14-year-old daughter of the landlady, and herself were all sitting on a porch when the entire yard seemed wrapped in a heavy shadow. All of a sudden, this... This, man, it seems like I should be doing like, you know, like old timey radio. All of a sudden, this shadow settled in a tree. We all looked up and we saw Batman. He was balancing himself on a tree limb and there was a, t a dim gray light all around him. She said the creature was about six and a half feet tall, wearing a dark black cape and skin tight dark pants, quarter length boots, and looked like a white man. I could see him plainly. I could see that he had big wings folded at his shoulders. Walker and young Judy Myers, daughter of Miss Vivian Myers, agreed in all respects. Uh, let's see. Keep going on. Ba -ba -bum -bum. Miss Myers said she got home just in time to see the flying paintbrush screwed across the sky. And another rumor, age 71, said he saw the weird shadow fellow in the tree, though he said he merely went back in and went to bed. That guy's pretty mellow. I see a Batman in the tree, especially some guy dressed as Batman in the tree. I'm going to watch. I'm not going back to sleep. Uh, that guy's pretty mellow. All righty, up next is, let's keep going. What the heck? Well, I, don't, I don't care. Let's keep going. Next up is the Wampus Cat. Now, this one doesn't have a lot of, of, about it at all. Every time I try to look up the Wampus Cat, it was about the same kind of stuff. But it really seems popular in Texas, so I didn't want to leave this one out. So this was a real short one. The Wampus Cat supposedly began as a tribal legend among the Native American hunters in Tennessee. They say a woman of the tribe who spied on the hunters while wearing a cougar skin was transformed into a half-woman, half-cougar by one of the tribal elders as a punishment. Why? Because she was just watching the dudes? Maybe they were, like, showering or something. I don't know. Uh, it eventually made its way to Texas and has been said to be a big cat, much like a cougar, just larger, more fearsome, and possibly with various types of mystical powers. Uh, a lot of people report the Wampus Cat as a giant bobcat with an uncanny, uncanny ability to swim and to disappear and reappear at will. 
So there's a lot going on for it, but there's very little stories at all, like at all. So on to the next one. All right, this next one. I actually talked about a bit a while ago, but I wanted to add this one as well because it was seen quite a bit in Texas. We're talking pterosaurs, thunderbirds, Quetzalcoatlus, whatever you want to call them. They're the same freaking thing. And they've been seen in Texas. Let's go back to 1976. The nation was celebrating its bicentennial and afternoon after all. Oh, oh, I can't say the words. Afternoon delight was the hit on the radio. You know what? Let's pause right there real quick. You guys ever listen to the lyrics of Afternoon Delight? You know the song, I'm going to find my baby on a hold a tight, going to grab some afternoon delight. That song from Anchorman, it's a really dirty song when you think about the lyrics. It's basically about fucking in daylight. And then there's this lyric. I always thought a fish could not be caught who wouldn't bite, but you got some bait awaiting, and I think I might try nibbling a little afternoon delight. That's dirty as hell. That was released in 1976. I got in trouble for listening to rap music in the 80s, but that was fine? Come on. Um, it's weird. Anyhow, um, policeman Arturo, Arturo Padilla of San Bendito, Texas. He spotted something weird in his headlights. It looked like a big bird, basically, and not the Sesame Street kind. Um, he's sitting there. He's like, what the hell is that? And while he's trying to figure out what he just saw, another officer, Homer Galvin, he reports the same thing over the radio. He says it appeared as a black silhouette that glided through the air. And according to Officer Galvin, it never even flapped its wings. A short time later, Alvarico, I don't know how to say his name. I was kind of thinking about it for a second there. I don't know how to say his name. Guajardo, who is a resident of Brownsville, Texas, reported he heard a thumping noise outside his mobile home at about 930 at night. And he thought that's way too late for some afternoon delight. So he went out to investigate. Uh, when he looked out there, out the door, he saw a monstrous bird standing in his yard. He said, it's like a bird, but it's not a bird. That animal is not from this world. Two sisters also told of seeing a big black bird with a face like a bat near a pond outside Brownsville, Texas. Then, reports kept coming for months until finally a radio station offer, offered a reward for the pterosaur's capture. Soon after, a television station broadcast a picture of an alleged bird track measuring about 12 inches in length. That's how big this bird is, this pterosaur is. Then, the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department were like, you know what, hunters are going to start shooting like whooping cranes and regular birds, you know, and Big Bird from Sesame Street. They were like, no way, man, we can't do that. So they made an announcement saying all birds are protected by the state or federal law. Now, about the same time that that was happening... Several Texas school teachers, they started seeing a pterosaur. They said it was a strange flying creature with a wingspan of at least 12 feet across while they were driving to work. One of them checked out the, a book in the school library, and yep, it was a pterosaur. And there's actually an article about that one. Um, let me quickly read that. A flying creature has spooked the South Texas area for decades. Do you think they're real? Teachers buzzed by big birds. Uh, it's basically the story I just told you. They, they, it shows the photo that they actually pointed out, and it's a pterosaur. The two identified a pair of what looked to be giant birds with bony structures and wingspans stretching 15 to 20 feet. Uh, they said it was a pteranodon, an extinct type of flying reptile that lived about 160 million years ago. News coverage from the San Antonio Evening News documented the sighting. A reporter reached out to the then director of the San Antonio Zoo, Luis de Zapato, to inquire about the claims that a pteranodon was flapping its wings in the Lone Star State. He said there's nothing in Texas today that would be that. I know of nothing that looks like that. But I sure would like two of them for the zoo. Yeah, all right. Or just let them live, you know. They said what exactly the creature saw that day is unknown, yet during that time and in the years preceding, dozens of similar sightings have reported in the San Antonio and Rio Grande Valley area. Rio Grande? Sure, why not? That same year, several sightings were reported near Harlington, Harling, Harlingen, Texas, according to two San Benito police officers. One of the strangest reports comes from that guy that I was name I can't say, who heard something slam into the side of his mobile home when he ventured outside to investigate. He was met face-to-face with a bird-like creature standing about four feet tall 
with eyes the size of silver dollars. It's got wings like a bird, but it's no bird, he said. That creature is not of this world. He likes saying that. That's a cool one. I love, absolutely love Thunderbird or Pteranodon or Pterosaur or Quetzalcoatl, whatever you want to call them. I love these kind of stories. And these aren't the only sightings. Here's just a few. The last three of these few are all from Texas, but the first couple are not. Uh, May 1961 in New York State. A businessman flying his private plane over the Hudson River Valley claimed that he was buzzed by a large flying creature that he said looked like a pterodactyl. That's cool. Uh, This next one, they don't give a specific date. They said it was in the 60s in California. A couple driving through Trinity National Forest reported seeing the silhouette of a giant bird that they estimated to have a wingspan of 14 feet. They later described it as being a pterodactyl. January 1976, Harlingen, Texas. Teens Jackie Davis and Tracy Lawson reported seeing, quote, a bird on the ground that stood five feet tall, was dark in color with a bald head and a face like a gorilla's with a sharp six-inch long beak. A subsequent investigation by their parents uncovered tracks that had three toes and were eight inches across. February 1976, San Antonio, Texas. Three elementary school teachers saw what they described as a pterodactyl swooping low over their cars as they drove. They said its wingspan was between 15 and 20 feet. One of the teachers commented that it glided through the air on huge bony wings like a bat. September 1982, Los Fresno, Texas. An ambulance driver named James Thompson was stopped while driving on the, on the Highway 100 by his sighting of, quote, a large bird-like object flying over the area. He described it as black or grayish with a rough texture, but no feathers. It had five to six foot wingspan, a hump on the back of its head, and almost no neck at all. After consulting some books to identify the creature, he decided it looked almost like a pterosaur. I gotta say, like I said a minute ago, I love pterosaur stories. There was a, I can't remember who it was off the top of my head. There's a listener on one of the live shows that actually had seen a thunderbird, a pterosaur, a pteranodon, whatever you want to call it. That is freaking awesome. I truly believe that there are, there is a big chance that pockets of creatures that we thought were long extinct are still out there. There's still enough area where they can, you know, run around and not be seen. I hope so anyway. All righty. I think the next one is the last one for, no, no, there's a couple more for the regular listeners. And then we're going to go over to, oh no, there's, this is the, this is the last one before we move over to the patron exclusive part of the episode. This next one is called the donkey lady of San Antonio. <sighs> this is another one when I was trying to investigate. Cause I was like, wow, that's a great title. The donkey lady of San Antonio. This is going to be cool. Well, this story changes drastically depending on where you get your info. Because either the donkey lady was first seen in the 1950s or the donkey lady was first seen in the 1800s. That's quite a bit of difference. That is not even like 10 or 20 years difference. It's 150 years difference. None of the stories give her name. They all just say a woman, a lady. Um, Also, I got to say, be very careful Googling donkey lady, because if you Google donkey lady and then you go to Google images, um, there's a lot, there's some women, I'll put it this way. There's some women that really love donkeys. That's all I'll say about that, but that's a different podcast. Uh, this one is about quote, some unnamed woman who suffers some quote, indeterminate, terrible fate. Some say drowning. Some saying be disfigured in a fire, which again, polar opposites. Um, And then there's the donkey side of the legend, which is said to have bitten the son of an important figure of the town and perished at the hands of his father. Sure, dick move, but okay. Uh, No no names at all in any of these stories. But uh, anyhow, let's go to the old Applewhite Bridge because people to this day swear they hear the horrifying braying of a donkey from the dark woods late at night. I, I don't know. It doesn't sound too too terrifying to me. Oh, it's, what's that sound? It's a donkey. All right, cool. Uh, the legend says that what you're hearing is the woman's ghost. Unless you go to a different website, and then they say it's not her ghost, but some kind of donkey lady cryptid that they don't really ever explain. Either way, 
Drivers are warned not to be surprised to find damage to their cars in the form of claw marks on the hood. Claw marks from who? The lady or the donkey? Because donkeys don't have claws. A cracked windshield or even blood. Yeah, that's it. That's the story's over. Can I move on to the next one? Nope, because it doesn't stop there. There's even a donkey lady hotline. Now I'm going to call, I, I, I wanted to call it earlier, but I was like, you know, I'm going to wait until I'm live to call the donkey lady hotline. It's going to be bad. I'm, it's probably some person's cell phone now, and I'm going to feel terrible about it. But uh, let's find out what happens when they call the donkey lady hotline that I could find online. The Google subscriber you have called is not available. Oh. A message after the tone. Is this the donkey lady hotline? Seems scary. I'd like to know more. Thank you. If you got pamphlets, I'd love one. All right. That was the donkey lady hotline. That didn't seem to do much. It wasn't. That was very anticlimactic. Anyhow, uh, the owner of the hotline says, you know what? The donkey lady, she's funny. You know, a merger of your tia or your abuelita and your coworker. She's all of us, really. Back in the 70s and 80s, she heard stories, each with its own neighborhood-specific variations, and friends used to tell her they'd call the hotline and hear creepy sounds. I didn't hear that. Or sometimes even talk to her if she surprised them by picking up the phone. I don't know. I don't know. All righty. So for the regular listeners, I'll be back in just a minute. It's going to be seem like no time at all to wrap up this episode. But patrons... I got a lot of stories to tell you. And I don't mean just one or two. I mean a lot of, including like I spoiled at the beginning or teased at the beginning. My favorite story of this episode is a patron-only story. Sorry, regular listeners. It's really cool, though. Anyhow, uh, listeners, regular listeners, see you in a second. Patrons, let's get to it. Let's bring back the regular listeners. Regular listeners, welcome back. Uh, Hold on. Hey, regular listeners, welcome back. Um, that'll just about do it for this week's episode of Texas Cryptids. I mean, there's a lot of weird ones. Texas, you never fail to be weird. I'll give you that. But again, I think that a lot of the patron ones and some of the regular listener ones are all the same creature. What creature? You've got to be a patron to find out. Or you can ask a patron, I suppose. It doesn't matter. You can ask a patron. I don't care. Uh, But uh, what Texas cryptid is the weirdest? No idea. Let me know. Leave a comment on whatever podcast player you listen to and tell me. um, And also, you know, tell your friends. I don't care. Once again, I'm your host, Kurt Sandvik, and this has been another edition of Paranormal Almanac. Yes, Miss Laura.